In this video, we introduce the New Testament book of Revelation by means of a top five. There's three different objectives for this video. The first is to be able to articulate three important things to know uh, about Revelation in your own words. So to be able to take uh, some of the items I've given you here and to put them into your own words and not necessarily all five of them, but I'm asking you to be able to do it with three. Uh, second, be able to explain what genre Revelation is and sort of uh, be able to connect that with how it's revealed in the text itself. Um, so we talked in the last video about what apocalyptic literature is. We're going to return to that topic with respect to Revelation itself in this video. And then lastly, to be able to uh, talk about the historical and cultural circumstances uh, that Revelation addresses and how Revelation is responding to these historical and cultural circumstances. So as to our course thesis, we're dealing with a particular New Testament text. Uh, and especially towards the end of the video here, we're going to see how Jesus is theologically significant um, for the author and audience of Revelation within their historical, cultural, and religious context. So we're going to start the video with a predictive top five. So our, our, sorry, predictive top three, I should say. So our lecture pause is for you to guess the three most important things uh, about Revelation that are going to be on here. So uh, whether or not your guesses are right or even close to right is no matter. The fact of making predictions helps us sort of get information out there to which we can uh, add on more information. So when we have ideas out there and we can add information onto it, we learn better. So what I want you to do is uh, go ahead and pause the lecture here and just in about a sentence for each, um, predict three things that you think might be on the top five here. All right, so let's get to it. So as to the actual top five, uh, the bonus item is the fact that our book is Revelation without the S. It's not a plural. It's not revelations. It's revelation. Uh, and also there is no antichrist in this book. So contrary to popular uh, sort of opinion and takes on the apocalyptic end of the world scenario, uh, we don't have antichrists or an antichrist figure in this particular book, though of course we do we do have uh, that kind of figure elsewhere in the New Testament, uh, interestingly in the plural in some cases. Uh, so our number five here is that Revelation is technically speaking a letter as to its, uh, as to its form, but it's better described as uh, a letter or better described as apocalyptic literature that is embedded in a letter. And so we're going to look at these uh, features of letters and apocalyptic. So we've seen this slide a uh, many, many times now. You're probably tired of seeing it by this point in the course uh, of our different elements of ancient letters. That so we have a uh, salutation with the names of the letter sender and the recipient, uh, and then also, uh, sorry, the names of the person sending the letter and the recipient. And then also in the salutation, we have a greeting to the person that's receiving the letter. We oftentimes have a thanksgiving that then moves into the body, the main content of the letter, and then a conclusion. When it comes to Revelation, we do have the uh, the sort of start of these features. We have a salutation that has uh, the name of the author and the name of the recipients, namely the seven churches in Asia. And we do have a greeting uh, and we do have a conclusion at the very, very end of this document. But everything else about a letter is, is missing. So it sort of starts as a letter and then moves on to doing something else altogether. Um, and that something else altogether is uh, being an apocalypse. And even in Revelation 1.1, Revelation is going to call itself an apocalypse, or in Greek, an apocalypsis, uh, which we often translate as Revelation, which is, of course, where this document gets its name from. But Revelation doesn't only call itself an apocalypse. It also calls itself a prophecy. Uh, so there's a way in which uh, when we think about prophecy, we, uh, we think about a commentary on present circumstances. This is what uh, one of the primary connotations of Old Testament prophecy is, that it's a commentary on sort of Israel's present circumstances based on the way that they are acting. Uh, so there's a way in which Revelation is doing that. It's a, a commentary 
on political circumstances or historical circumstances, but it's also forward looking as, uh, as Old Testament prophecy also is. That there's a sense in which the commentary on what is happening uh, politically or, or how Israel is doing as it were with respect to their worship of God, how that has effects on what might happen in the future. So you get a sense of that sort of forward looking nature in the sense that Revelation is a prophecy as well and in two different places refers to itself as such. And lastly, Revelation calls itself a book at its end as well, uh, in Greek a biblion. So all of this to say, uh, Revelation is not strictly or not only a letter, but it has these other features of uh, calling itself an apocalypse, calling itself a prophecy, and calling itself a book. Uh, and as we go into Revelation itself, we see that it has uh, features of apocalyptic that we talked about in that last video, that there's a seer in Revelation, that we have uh, the, the audience addressed seems to be persecuted or is suffering in some way. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later on in the video. We have these uh, vivid visions and symbolism and imagery with other world re realities and uh, sort of fantastic creatures. We have a tour of heaven or at least a vision of heaven. We have cosmic catastrophes. And lastly, and probably mo most importantly for the message of Revelation, we have a future hope for those who are faithful. So remember, one of the features of apocalyptic literature is oftentimes things in the present aren't so good, but there is hope for the future. And we get a strong sense of that in the book of Revelation. So Revelation uh, is technically a letter, but has some of these other features, particularly of apocalyptic literature to it. Uh, number four, Revelation is a text that's meant to be uh, experienced and not simply explained. So uh, the sort of takeaway from this is that we don't take each little bit of Revelation, each little image in Revelation, and try and make some kind of one-to-one -one correspondence with something else historically and try to explain away uh, that imagery. But the vivid imagery brings about sort of a whole, a whole different experience to this text that's unlike any other text in the New Testament. Uh, and so one of the ways that I like to uh, sort of get at this fact that Revelation is sort of really, really vivid and it's meant to be, to sort of be imagined rather than explained is to look at different ways that scenes from Revelation are depicted in various art forms. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm not going to talk about each one of these images. I'm just going to sort of go through them and you can pause and take a closer look at it if you want. But each one is going to be related to one of three different texts from Revelation. So I encourage you to pause this here and just really quickly read these five verses from Revelation chapter one, and then we're going to look at how they have been uh, depicted artistically in different kinds of ways. So here we have uh, an ancient iconographic uh, version of John chapter one. And one of my favorite... Uh, Artistic depictions of Revelation is from what's called the Brick Bible uh, with, with Legos. And so we're going to see a couple of different places uh, where Legos sort of can do more with, uh, as a medium, as an artistic medium, uh, Legos be because of the way one can connect them together, you can depict the things in Revelation in ways that you might not be able to uh, in different other art forms here. So here's a, a Brick Bible version of it. And then on to Revelation chapter 5, a couple of verses here. Go ahead and pause, read the text from Revelation, and then we'll take a look very briefly at the experience, the artistic experience of the imagery of Revelation chapter 5. All right, here we have it in mosaic format. So each one of those uh, small little stones there to, com to comprise our, uh, our entire image of Revelation 5. In a stained glass format, you see the eyes on the animals there. The tattoo version of Revelation 5, 6. And then what's called the cubist, uh, this is cubist art, where sort of when you look at the image, the way that it's constructed, you can sort of really think about turning a cube and looking at the piece from different kinds of angles. 
And then once again, the brick Bible here, uh, the ability to put multiple eyes on the animals is a, a sort of a unique thing that, that Legos can do here, which I think is a particularly uh, interesting take. Um, and I also like how the lamb is sort of uh, extra large in this version. And our last one, uh, the sun woman and the red dragon from Revelation chapter 12. So go ahead and pause, read these verses from Revelation, and we'll take a, take a look at just a handful of artistic renditions of them. So here we have uh, William Blake is, of course, one of the most famous uh, artists who depicts scenes from, from Revelation. So the beast sort of hovering over the woman here. And then from a different sort of angle. And then again, our brick Bible version. All right, all of that to say is sort of the imagery of Revelation. When we experience it or when we imagine it or see it artistically depicted, it really does something different than, we, than if we just try to explain sort of all of the minute details or all the minute aspects of the text itself. Number three, we have... Uh, roughly speaking, three different reading approaches that have been taken to uh, Revelation, not only throughout history, but also sort of in the present day. And these are usually called something like the futurist approach, the idealist approach, and the historic, uh, historical approach. Um, and I should say, as we move to looking at what these are, these are sort of generalized, and there is some overlap between them. It's not as though you sort of have to put yourself in one of these in one of these camps. That there's there's a way in which uh, there might be there there are things that are sort of future oriented about Revelation, but that is not uh, sort of completely at odds with a sort of idealist approach. And we'll talk about what these are uh, right here now. So when we talk about the futurist approach, we're talking about um, an approach that really sees Revelation as about predicting a future that has not happened yet, that it is a time that is, uh, that is still to come, that it's telling us about what is going to happen at the end of the ages or at the end of the world. And this, of course, uh, has been... Um, has been popularized in uh, sort of modern Christian culture by uh, books like The Late Great uh, Planet Earth in the 1970s, written by Hal Lindsey, or the Left Behind series, which was uh, massively popular, especially amongst evangelicals, uh, but even amongst sort of wider circles of Christians and otherwise in the 1990s. It takes this sort of approach of uh, the elements of Revelation, the, the different scenes and the different sort of individual images images are meant to correspond to something that's going to happen in the future. So for example, Revelation chapter 9, some, sort of one of the, uh, the sort of most interesting and absurd takes on this, in my opinion, is this bit of, from Revelation chapter 9 of smoke coming from locusts of the earth, um, referring to, and these scorpions referring to helicopters. So the idea is that Revelation 9, uh, this imagery of animals, uh, of insects, and scorpions um, is actually referring to to helicopters and this is something something else in its entirety that John uh, didn't know about in his present context because helicopters you know wouldn't be invented for centuries to come so uh, the one of the emphasis of this approach is that revelation is describing a time that is particularly painful and chaotic and there's a sense in which that is very very accurate the futuristic approach really gets at the sort of suffering that is inherent to revelation the sort of pain and difficulty and oppression that is in there but it sees it not as uh, an aspect of necessarily of john's time but it is of uh, pain and suffering that is yet to come and the major critique of this way of thinking about Revelation is that Revelation would have had almost no uh, value for its original audience, uh, audience or audiences in the form of the seven churches. Is that they're sort of there just as historical placeholders. 
uh, they're as an audience, they're just a placeholder for something that is to come so that there's no sense in which uh, Revelation is relevant to them because these things aren't going to happen in their time. And uh, then you can sort of carry that forward to anyone that has lived uh, before the the end has come in this futuristic view. So that because the end hasn't come yet, Revelation really has no relevance for, for anyone uh, up to present time uh, until we are sort of predicting what the end is going to be like. The idealist approach takes more sort of a, a generalized tact, that Revelation is really not about the future at all, that it's not meant to predict the future, it's not meant to tell what is to come, but Revelation is really dealing with sort of universal themes of, uh, of suffering and oppression and, and hope and victory for Christians that is spiritually meaningful for people of any time period. So it, it sort of uh, eschews... Um, a, a sort of thinking about Revelation in its past historically and in its future and to say that the vivid and symbolic language is applicable to Christians of all times. And so the uh, the critique of, of this approach would be that uh, it it sort of downplays the fact that Revelation does in fact call itself prophecy and there is a forward-looking temporal dimension to apocalyptic uh, literature and it also uh, downplays in a in a way the relevance for the original audience. So while John is writing universal themes, so insofar as those themes can sort of be hooked into by the original audience, uh, the the sense is that for the idealist approach is that John is not necessarily writing about things in his time. That the 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 relevance isn't particularly for the uh, the seven churches that John is writing to, but it's but it's universal. And so, insofar as those churches can uh, can find relevance in those universal themes, the Book of Revelation is still relevant to them, but not in a specific historical kind of way, which is going to be at odds with the historical approach to Revelation which is really going to think about Revelation in its past uh, and not necessarily about its universal themes or the ways that it's predicting the future. And so the main purpose of this approach is to really think about what's going on in the first century world. What is it that John, uh, what situation is John addressing and writing to when he writes the book of Revelation. Um, and so this is going to really read Revelation within the literary genre of apocalyptic literature as we have done, uh, as we've done this week and as we did in the last video. Um, and it's going to help us sort of make sense of what makes um what makes Revelation tick or what makes Revelation work in its original context. So thinking about the historical and cultural settings of Revelation in that context uh, to, to be able to understand what's going on in the first century world. Um, and so the historical, uh, the historical perspective is going to think of those futuristic aspects of Revelation that we do find in the book um, as really being about the original audience's future. And this is where the critique of uh, the historical approach sort of comes in, in, in my opinion, is that it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really, get at how Revelation can continue to be uh, relevant for Christians of any time, and specifically for Christians who are suffering or oppressed uh, in any particular time. So that be, by situating it uh, mostly in the past, you lose some of the sort of theological edge to, uh, to Revelation for Christians today. So broadly speaking, three different ways to approach Revelation. Again, those aren't mutually exp uh, exclusive. Uh, I would say that my own approach is to take uh, elements primarily of the historical and idealist uh, way of reading Revelation, but even to also think about the ways that Revelation does look to the future in some ways. So there's a way in which that uh, it's easy it's easy for um, for us to uh, dismiss the futuristic approach altogether, but I don't think that's necessarily the right thing uh, to do. That There's a sort of way in which all three of these approaches have aspects to them that are beneficial for our own reading and interpretation of Revelation. 
Number two, uh, so really getting at the historical way of reading Revelation. Revelation was probably written sometime between 65 CE, so this would be before the fall of the Jerusalem Temple in 70 CE. Uh, so this is the sort of earlier end for dating Revelation, and 100 CE on the later end. Um, it's written by someone named John, who that John is, we'll talk about in just a second here, uh, to Christians that are undergoing some kind of persecution. And so our decisions about the specific date are going to be tied up with a number of different things, as are uh, our decisions about who this John is. So we're first going to deal with John, uh, and Revelation is one of those texts in the New Testament that explicitly names its author, that it is written, the Apocalypse is written by John. Uh, he appears, his name appears twice in the first five verses of the document. But who this John is, is sort of, uh, much like Revelation itself, is a bit of a mystery. One thing to note is that this John is not a... Uh, is not pseudepigraphical. It's not uh, appending, it's not using a name of an ancient figure as do the apocalypses of Enoch and Daniel. Remember when we looked at those texts, we said that Enoch and Daniel are both figures from Israel's past, that the present is sort of projecting, uh, projecting the authorship onto a past figure. That's not the case with John, uh, that John isn't uh, a figure from uh, ancient Christian past, but is the person that is actually writing this document. Now the question is, who is this John? We have a number of different options. Uh, the early sort of Christian testimony that it is John, one of Jesus's 12 uh, apostles. Um, because John the Apostle was connected with Ephesus early on in Christian history. And Ephesus, if you look on a map, uh, the island of Patmos is sort of just off the, uh, the edge of, uh, of, of Ephesus, where Ephesus is. Um, and this would uh, sort of traditionally make this John the same author as the, uh, the, the Gospel of John and the epistles. Um, if you take sort of the traditional authorship to the epistles, to the Gospel of John, and to Revelation. Um, but then there's some problems that arise with seeing all of those documents written by the same person. Uh, the biggest one, the one that jumps out right away when you read them in Greek, is that their styles uh, pretty dramatically differ from one another. They just read a whole lot different. They also uh, are uh, the revel revelation is missing key themes that we see repeated in the gospel and the letters, particularly around uh, love. The, the word love in its noun and verb form is a favorite of both the gospels and the letters, which is pretty largely missing in Revelation. Um, and Revelation doesn't engage scripture the same way that the gospels and the, the letters do. So there's some issues with uh, sort of pinning these all these documents to the same author. Um, and so the other option is that some other uh, important early Christian who had some kind of authority, uh, some random guy named John, wrote, wrote this document. So our sort of two main options for who this John is is some John we don't necessarily know much else about, or John, one of, of Jesus' apostles. Uh, regardless of which one it is, there's some things that we can sort of glean about John's identity from the text of Revelation itself. Uh, and this is uh, one that he knows Old Testament scripture, even though he does not quote it explicitly. So uh, Revelation is a text that sort of is really sort of imbued with the imagery and the theology and an understanding of the Old Testament though John is not going to say, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, and then quote Isaiah the prophet. Uh, obviously, John is also familiar with the apocalyptic genre because he is writing an apocalypse. It appears based on the style of Revelation um, that and some, some uh, peculiar features of it, that, uh, that Greek is not John's first language, that uh, it appears that probably the writer's first language is, uh, is probably Aramaic, um, and that Greek is, is, they're not writing in their native tongue. Um, also, the author of John assumes that the audience is going to accept uh, their authority, that he doesn't mention anything about his credentials, but just assumes what he writes will be accepted by this uh, 
this wide geographical range of churches uh, of churches in Asia Minor. Um, and then lastly, from the text of John itself, we learned that John is on uh, at the Isle of Patmos. Um, and the implication seems to be that it, he is um, has it's a forced exile there because Patmos was uh, a common place and sort of was stereotypical of uh, a stereotypical location uh, and a historical location for prisoners to be sent to. Um, so we get even from the sense of where John is writing from already some kind of sense of persecution or suffering in Revelation. And so moving to that idea of persecution, uh, we see it mentioned several different times in, in Revelation. So I give you the references here, and I give you uh, just one, one text uh, printed here. I'm going to read it for us. Revelation 2, 9 through 10. I know your affliction and your poverty, even though you are rich. I know the slander on the part of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Beware, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you may be tested. And for 10 days you will have affliction. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. So uh, we get the sense from this passage and others that, uh, that the audience of Revelation is sort of having uh, issues on, on two sides. One is from Jewish synagogues. Uh, so the author says those who claim they are Jews and are not. Um, so the author is sort of uh, saying that because of their actions, um, you know, they must not actually be be true Jews. Uh, so that's the one side of the uh, the uh, problem that Revelation's audience is, is having. And the other side is the general Greco-Roman population. Um, we've talked about this with respect to First Peter in this class previously, that the suffering is probably not sort of this official persecution that's uh, from the top down, from the, em uh, the emperor saying Christians need to be persecuted persecuted, but as a result of the sort of peculiar way that Christians would not engage in certain affairs. Uh, and those certain affairs are going to be uh, primarily Rome's political theology. And so the Rome's political theology, uh, sort of the basis of this, is that the gods chose Rome um, and that as the when the Romans, uh, when the Roman Empire sort of does the gods' will, um, things are going to go well. That uh, that Rome and the emperor uh, and the empire at large um, sort of in uh, embody the gods' will, salvation, and rule and presence among human beings. So uh, Rome is sort of manifesting or making real the gods' blessings, especially peace and security, uh, pax et securitas in Latin, uh, to all who submit to Rome's rule. And so a failure to sort of buy into this system and worship the Roman gods uh, and to uh, sort of uh, be the Roman God's blessing to the world uh, makes makes for trouble um, so that Christians get labeled atheists insofar as they don't believe in uh, the Roman the Roman gods. Um, and particularly what seems to be one of the issues in uh, Revelation or one of the issues Revelation is addressing is Christians failure uh, or not even failure, uh, intentional decision not to worship the empire and to not participate in civic activities. And by not doing so, they're sort of uh, early Christians are seen as unpatriotic. They're not buying into the political theology uh, of Rome and are then thus seen as sort of causing problems that the gods uh, are not going to continue blessing Rome if there's this group of people that's not not doing their part, uh, not buying into the political theo theological system and currying the gods' favor. And so then this leads to the question of uh, our, our, our issue of dating and uh, what what sort of setting we're talking about for this kind of suffering and persecution. So what we've laid out there so far is that there does seem to be some kind of suffering and persecution that Christians are facing. Um, and there are imperial situations or times under different emperors um, 
when uh, when Christians were were facing some kind of suffering and persecution, again, probably not sort of a top down way, but more of a local kind of persecution. Um, and because they were largely failing, Christians were refusing to worship uh, worship the emperors, and they were refusing to worship the polytheistic gods. And so then the question is, if we're going to set Revelation in its historical context, which emperor is it uh, that the Christians are particularly not worshiping? And we have two main options that are going to correspond to different dates for when Revelation might have been written. So the first option and the earlier option is the Roman Emperor Nero, uh, and then the second option option is the Roman Emperor Domitian. So Nero is going to reign for 14 years between 54 and 68. Domitian is going to be later, 81 to 96. And as we've seen previously in this class, Nero was particularly famous uh, for the way that he treated Christians. Um, particularly blaming them for a fire that happened in Rome in 64 CE. Um, and I give this, uh, it's kind of small there, but you can see uh, the text um, of uh, that, that tells us about uh, Nero fastening the blame onto Christians for the fire in Rome in 64 CE. Um, so because Nero is sort of the one who is known for um, uh, persecuting Christians. This is sort of a point in favor of Revelation being written under Nero. But this was not the position of the early church. The early church thought that Revelation uh, referred to Domitian. So we see this in Irenaeus, Tertullian, Clement, and uh, Origen. Um, and what's uh, even, what's sort of uh, particular about Domitian is that Domitian himself would refer to himself as a god and demanded that, that, uh, that he be worshipped. And so when we have statements like we have in Revelation 13, 4, this seems to map on in a way to Domitian's sort of self-understanding and what he has commanded better than it does uh, than it does Nero. Um, but the sort of uh, the thing hanging over uh, uh, hanging over Domitian in favor of Revelation not being written in the setting of of Domitian's reign is that Domitian is not known for persecuting Christians the way that um, the way that Nero is. Uh, one last bit here, and again, this one in uh, in point in favor of Revelation being written un later under Domitian is uh, what's called numismatic evidence, evidence from coinage. So you see here we have a, a, a figure sitting on top of the earth holding seven stars, and uh, the the words here are referring to Domitian's reign. And so then in Revelation 1-6, we seem to have maybe a parody of, uh, of this coin with Jesus uh, holding seven stars, um, maybe being sort of a reference to this imperial ideology that's minted onto uh, the literal currency of the Roman Empire itself. Uh, but then the, the sort of main text for figuring out which emperor seems to be referred to in Revelation, and thus uh, the imperial rule under which, or the uh, the emperor who was ruling when Revelation was written is uh, Revelation th uh, 13, 18, and this bit about the number 666. Um, so to sort of uh, figure out who might be being, being referred to here, what's going on in the text of Revelation is what is called gematria. And we've seen this previously with Matthew's gospel. Remember, Matthew makes this, rev uh, this reference to the number 14 uh, in the very beginning of the gospel to connect Jesus to David. Remember the Hebrew letters for David add up to the numbers 14 and Matthew has organized his genealogy in series of 14. There is something similar going on in Revelation here where uh, the author seems to be hinting at a particular person based on the number of their name, that the letters of their name add up to, uh, to 666. And so if we're to uh, sort of uh, figure this out, um, from the uh, from the Hebrew, 
if we have Caesar Nero or Kaiser Neron in, in Hebrew here, if each of these letters in Hebrew correspond to a number, when we add this up, we get 666 for Nero. Um, and then an alternate tradition, um, if you look in your English text, you'll often see a note that says some manuscripts have 616. And the theory goes uh, because uh, the missing uh, the Hebrew vav here, um, that, that there's two different sort of ways to spell Nero uh, in, uh, in Hebrew with or without this letter. And when you take it out, you get 50 less, which adds up to 616. Uh, so that would seem to point in favor of uh, Nero being the reference to 666 and 616. But you also have a very common abbreviation uh, on coinage, um, for Domitian that also is going to add up, uh, the, the Greek letters here are going to add up to 666 as well. So all, what this suggests is that, uh, well, we can maybe take some clues from Gematria as to who is being referred to. The, uh, the problem with Gematria, however, is that it's, you know, it's not an exact science um, and there's ways in which the sort of numbers can be massaged to have 666 refer to different figures. And so we've seen this, uh, you, you see this sort of throughout history, especially with respect to political leaders, that there's different ways to, to make it so that uh, a certain political figure's number adds up to 666. And one of the, my favorite ways that this uh, sort of uh, has been illustrated by a colleague of mine is to uh, show how we can we can turn Barney, the cute purple dinosaur, uh, into the number 666 by sort of just massaging some aspects of uh, this uh, Barney's name by, by calling him the cute purple dinosaur, by Latinizing, uh, Latinizing his, uh, his name here, uh, removing some letters to refer to Latin numbers, uh, and then doing some, you know, our, our fancy math here, we can come up with 666. So those are the so there's a sense in which um, you can make this 666 by doing uh, by doing this kind of thing into whomever you want. And we saw that in the previous slide with there is a case that can be made by, by sort of uh, moving the letters around to make a case for different figures. So at the end of the day, um, we're not going to probably have a firm case for a particular figure. Uh, so we're, we're never gonna sort of know for sure. Uh, it seems most likely that uh, the author of Revelation, John, is referring either to Nero or to Domitian, but because of the sort of flexibility of gematria, um, it's difficult to determine for certain who it is. But most importantly, um, it's a figure who's going to put themselves in the place of a god and demand worship, which is of course going to be um, going to be problematic for early Christians uh, who would call that idolatry. So all that to say, uh, if we situate Revelation as written under the reign of Nero and Nero being referred to by the number 666, we're dealing with an earlier writing for, for Revelation, namely bef uh, during Nero's reign and before he died, uh, around 65 CE. And if it's on the later end, or if it's uh, if Domitian is being referred to, we have Revelation written on the later end, being one of the last New Testament documents at around 100 CE. And the last bit here is going to sort of combine some of these things, particularly our historical and cultural context of what's going on in Revelation and our different reading strategies or reading approaches for Revelation. And I think thinking about Revelation as what we might call a theopo uh, theopoetic and theopolitical text, that is a text that is poetic insofar as it's using vivid imagery and visions and theopolitical insofar as it is, uh, it has a political message that is imbued with theology or that is theologically motivated. Um, is uh, is sort of a, a different way for us to 
to look at the text. And, and it's something to really sort of be on the lookout for as we read Revelation, to be on the lookout for the theology and the poetics of Revelation, and to be on the lookout for the theology and the politics of Revelation at the same time. And what what sort of, uh, what brings that theology and the poetics and what brings the theology uh, and the, the politics together is the figure of the crucified Jesus in Jesus's exalted and cosmic form, so that uh, so that when we look at text of Revelation itself, we find that Jesus, uh, by means of Jesus's crucifixion, Jesus's death and resurrection and ascension, uh, is is worthy of, of of worship. That that is a theological. Uh, poetical, and it's also a theological, political message. And we see this in a number of, of different texts here. Um, two from Revelation chapter 5, coming right after one another, but also from uh, from Revelation chapter uh, 11. So we, we see the political nature of of the texts, uh, the text of Revelation sort of clearly displayed um, in these different places with Jesus sort of standing at the center of all of them.